Uh, recently, there's been a, a spate of scam text messages targeting Christians. I mentioned it in our last email update, so please be on the watch. Uh, the fake message says that it comes from the minister of your church. It often says he's in a meeting or he's busy and he needs you to urgently send money or gift cards. As I mentioned in the email update, I had a phone call from another minister in our, our region, a minister from another church, who received one of these text messages claiming to be from me. And the guy was fooled. He called me up because he wanted to know when I was coming to collect the Amazon gift cards. At first, when this guy called me, I thought he had completely lost it. I mean, he's not a young man, uh, and I thought he'd, he'd, he'd just completely lost the plot. What was he talking about? But then as he, as he kept talking, I realised, no, he hasn't lost the plot. He's been duped by a fake message. And the scammers are getting smarter, aren't they? It's easy to be duped. It's getting harder and harder to pick out dodgy phone calls and text messages. But still, the best way to know what's fake is to know what's genuine. Does the message sound like the kind of thing your friend or minister would really say? Would he call himself Pastor Daniel in a text? Would he say that he's too busy to call and then urgently ask you for money via text message? As we open up 1 Thessalonians today, we're going to hear about what makes faith genuine. How does pressure and affliction reveal genuine faith? Faith that's not a fraud, faith that's not a scam. And we're going to be encouraged as we hear this part of God's word to live out genuine faith in Jesus no matter what. Now I said this at the start of our series. We've been going through 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians where we're looking at the two letters written to the church in Thessalonica. We started with 2 Thessalonians, which might be a bit strange because... 2 Thessalonians is, well, it's number 2. Why would you start there? The reason we did is we don't know for certain which letter was written first. Paul didn't put dates on his letters. Uh, The reason it's 1 Thessalonians and then 2 Thessalonians, it's just, well, they're actually both letters, aren't they, written to the church in Thessalonica, but the reason for the numbering, 1 and 2, 1 is the longer letter, and that's the reason it's first in our English Bibles. 1 Thessalonians, which we're starting today, is a letter written by Paul and his mission team to the church, the gathered people of God in Thessalonica, uh, which is in modern day Greece. You can see it where it is up on the screen. So have a listen to verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, Silas and Timothy, it's Paul and his mission team, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Uh, The first thing Paul says to this church is his thankfulness to God. So have a look from verse 2. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, You hear people talk about gratitude, don't you? Uh, Some people keep a gratitude journal, a book where every day you write one thing you're thankful for. It's not a bad thing, is it, to be grateful? Though I'll admit I find it a bit hollow. What does it mean to have a general sense of gratitude or of thankfulness? It doesn't actually make sense, does it? Thankfulness needs to be directed to someone. Thanks, Mum, for cooking a great meal for us. Thanks, Kids for coming and visiting us. You brought you out to a meal. You have an amazing meal. Sorry, out for out for dinner. You got an amazing meal that's brought to the table. You don't just go, you know, look at the meal and say thanks into the air. No, you thank the the waiter and the chef. Paul thanks God for His work in the Thessalonians, for God saving them and growing them as disciples of Jesus, giving them faith, hope, and love, and then growing them in it. And now, just think about this for a moment. Notice Paul's giving thanks. Who does he thank? He thanks God. He doesn't thank the Thessalonians. He doesn't congratulate them for their faith, hope and love. He thanks God because these things come from God. God works. He gives. He creates faith, hope and love in his people, which is why Paul gives thanks not to the Thessalonians, but to God. I'm thinking about Thanksgiving. What about us? What about you? 
Paul kicks off this letter and the first words that come out of his pen is giving thanks. Does that sound like you? I don't think so. At least not for many of us. We're inclined to grumble. The weather is always too hot, too cold. The chairs are always too hard or too soft. The council is useless because they don't fix the roads and then they collect rates to fund the fixing of the roads and we grumble about that. We are very good at grumbling. We live in a world of grumbling. Our culture teaches us grumbling is good. If you learn from people's example, that's the lesson we're to learn, isn't it? But God's people give thanks. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't notice things that could be improved. Our, we live in a world groaning because of the curse of sin. The Psalms, the Bible, the biggest book in the Bible is full of songs of lament, crying out to God in pain and suffering. But lament, crying out to God, is not grumbling. So we aren't called to ignore difficulties, but genuine Christianity is marked by thankfulness, giving thanks to God. We give thanks to him for the things in creation, his provision. So saying thanks before meals, and thanks to God as well as to the person who may have cooked it, but thanks to God, it's a good habit, isn't it? How about giving thanks to God for beauty and goodness in creation? It's good to develop a habit of, you know, you quickly say thanks to God when you see a, a bright full moon lit night or you hear a beautiful bird song. It's, let's learn to be quick to give thanks for what God is doing in creation. And even more, like Paul does here, give thanks for what we have in Jesus. And not only what God is doing in us and for us, but what he's doing in others. Paul thanks God for the faith, hope and love in the Thessalonians. What about you? Do you give thanks to, for God keeping and growing others here in church? When you see someone who's trusting in Jesus, do you thank God? When they do something out of Christian love or endure, keep trusting in Jesus, do you give thanks to God for doing that in them? Now, last week... I was down in Sydney for the Presbyterian Church of Assembly Australia. One of the great joys, there was moments that weren't joyous, but one of the great joys was hearing about what God is doing in churches, not only in Australia, that was good, but what was best was hearing what we had visitors from India, Korea, Vanuatu and New Zealand. It's great to hear what they were saying. People are becoming Christians. Men and women are being trained for gospel ministry. There was also many stories of persevering in hardship and struggle. And these are all things to give thanks for. Do you? Do we or or do you grumble? Well, as Paul gives thanks to God, the first thing out of his pen is thanks to God. He then goes on to recall how the gospel first came to Thessalonica. He reminds them and himself of all those reasons to give thanks to God. Verse 4, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. How does Paul know that the Thessalonians are genuine Christians? How does he know he should give thanks to God instead of being anxious for their salvation? Well, he says he knows that they've been chosen by God. He knows that God loves them because of how they've responded to, how they've received the gospel. They received God's word, the good news of Jesus, with power and the Holy Spirit. Now, you hear those words, what first comes into your mind as you hear power and the Holy Spirit? It might make you think about signs and wonders, miracles. But I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here. I don't think it's what Paul means because in Acts 17, Acts 17 is where it's Paul's visit to Thessalonica is recorded. There's no mention. No mention in Acts 17 of healings or exorcisms. Paul goes to Thessalonica, he preaches, 
people believe and believers are persecuted. In Thessalonica, the power of the Holy Spirit is shown in people believing and believers being persecuted and then standing firm through persecution. The power of God's Holy Spirit is seen in people believing, receiving God's word. People moving from hating Jesus to loving Jesus. People moving from living for themselves to living for God. This is huge. It requires the power of the Holy Spirit. And even more, it takes the Holy Spirit's power to stick with Jesus through persecution. And not just stick with Jesus, but doing so with joy. And Jesus told the story of of the gospel landing on different types of soil. Plenty of seed is sown. The same seed is sown. The same gospel is preached. And lots of it falls in places where it's hard to grow. But the Thessalonian church is good soil. They bear fruit, the fruit of conviction and joy, even through suffering. How do we know? How do we know they're good soil? Because they are fully convinced. They received the truth of Jesus with full conviction. They kept believing that Jesus is the risen and reigning king, the only way for salvation. And they kept hold of this truth, not wavering, even when some of their neighbours, friends and families became a furious mob. Some of us have experienced this personally. People getting angry, angry at us because we know, love and trust the Lord Jesus. Others of us are afraid because we're shaken because it might happen to us. You hear the the person on TV or the internet, they're furious, they're, they're foaming at the mouth, angry at churches and Christians. And when you hear that, you hear the level of anger and vitriol. You Instead of feeling joy, so often we feel anxious. Now we've got to admit, there have been times when Christians are the furious mob. Sadly, in response to other people's anger, Christians have allied themselves with a different furious mob and we've just inflamed the the tension and the, the anger. Instead of finding joy in Jesus, we find security in the shock jock or the or the populist politician who's willing to trade on our anxiety for their own power or fame, but that's not the Thessalonians. And that's not the way of genuine Christianity. True Christianity is shown through joy in much affliction. But how do we do this? How do we have joy in the Holy Spirit in the midst of affliction? Well, first of all, it's not fooling yourself, calling pain pleasure. No, the much joy is the joy of knowing sin is forgiven. Look back at verse 1. It's the joy of knowing God is our Father because Jesus is our Saviour. It's the joy of knowing this is true because of the Spirit of God within us. It's not calling pain pleasure. It's recognising that pain is pain, but God is still good because our sins are forgiven. And how do we grow in this joy? How do we grow and learn joy in the midst of suffering? It's by imitating other believers. That's what verse 6 says. It's about following the right example. Verse 6 says that the church in Thessalonica saw how Paul and his mission team, they had joy even when they suffered. And then verse 7, this continues, doesn't it? The Thessalonians become examples for believers in the regions around them, the towns around them. One of the great resources God has given us is, is each other. It's brothers and sisters in the faith. They are our examples. They are our teachers. We learn from the things they did that grew their faith and their joy. We're encouraged as we see how God kept and preserved them through difficulty. Uh, The Bible says, bad company corrupts good character. If we surround ourselves with grumblers, guess what? You're going to learn to be a good grumbler. But if we surround ourselves with examples of joy in affliction, then we'll join their perseverance. And so this is the challenge, the call for, for our church. God calls us to be examples of joy and thankfulness even in suffering. I wonder whether you can think of someone who's been that for you, who's been an example of joy in suffering. Maybe it's someone in our church. Maybe it's someone you could say thanks to them for doing that over over lunch today. I want to say thanks the way you kept trusting in Jesus when you lost your job. That was such an encouragement to me. The way you 
persevered in prayer and how you found comfort in the scriptures during your serious illness and battling through the treatment. How you kept gathering with God's people and singing God's praise even as you experienced tragedy in your family. Thank you so much for doing that. It encouraged me. You set an example for me. Thinking about examples and the way actually the kinds of people who've been examples to me and I trust have been examples to you, it makes you realise that when you're suffering, when you're suffering you can feel like you've got nothing to give. You're completely spent just barely surviving. And you think, the last thing I can do is be with the church. No one wants to be with me when what I'm feeling in my heart is written all over my body. If I was to go there, I'd just bring everyone else down. That's not true, is it? No, just persevering in the basics, loving Jesus, praying and praising in the midst of pain, by doing those what appear extraordinarily simple things at times, just doing them, you minister deeply to your brothers and sisters in Christ. So thank you for doing it. So how do we know genuine Christianity? First, genuine thankfulness. Second, genuinely receive God's word, even in the midst of hardship. And I hope you've been seeing this. Both of those things, thankfulness, joy in suffering, receiving God's word, it's it's actually not just something in our head. This is real change, real conversion, and which is what Paul saw in the Thessalonians. So verse 9, For they themselves, that's the churches of Macedonia and Achaia, the regions around Thessalonica, they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the, ro- the coming wrath. True Christianity is a radical change, a total change. There are three parts of the change, three steps, turning, serving and waiting. Turning, the Thessalonians turned to God away from worshipping idols. And this means they would have stopped going to the temple, stopped making prayers and sacrifices to pretend gods. Now, you hear that and you go, well, that would have been pretty straightforward. It's not that hard to stop doing religious rituals. It's actually what most people around us, most people in Gympie are like, isn't it? People no longer feel they have to pretend they have faith in Jesus. There's no cultural pressure to pretend. And so, well, let's stop doing religious things because no one's forcing me to pretend. But that's not what it would have been like back in Thessalonica. Turning to God from idols would have been hard. Because it's not just a, a, an empty ritual, just going to the temple. But when you've always lived as if life and death depends on whether you do the right offering to the right God at the right time, and if you do all of this, the crops will grow and your family will be healthy. But if you don't do this, the crops and animals will die and you will starve. If this has been your whole life, if everyone around you says this is true, and then you turn away from this and instead trust in Jesus where there are no sacrifices, no offerings, no religion you need to do, that actually would have been very hard. It would have felt very risky to turn your back on the gods of your people. What if they get upset that now I'm I'm trusting in Jesus? But the church of the Thessalonians did. And throughout history, millions and maybe billions of people have done that, turned their back on idols and turned to serve the living and true God. Though some have thought the risk too much, haven't they? And they've tried having a bet each way. Instead of turning from idols, they just add the God of the Bible to their list of gods. And this is something we can all so easily do. What are the idols of Australian culture? What might we have not totally turned from, but we're actually still having a bed each way? You know, it might not be that you go to a temple and offer uh, some incense or leave some food in front of a statue, but what Paul elsewhere says that greed is idolatry. Trusting in money rather than God, having our, our minds and our hearts and our thoughts constantly about finances, cost of living, uh, the, the economy, what we do or don't have in our bank accounts. When our greatest joy is the, the house we live in or the travel we can do, greed is a subtle but distractive idol. We can even make an idol of our family. 
We'll do anything we, we can to make our family happy, comfortable and secure. Actually, at that point, it's often just ourselves that are our idols, aren't they? Self is the idol. We want to be happy, comfortable and secure, even if it's at the cost of living for Jesus. Now, these kind of cultural idols are tricky. It's a little bit more obvious if you're literally going to a statue and putting some food in front of it. It's also a bit trickier because money and family are good gifts from God. They become an idol when we allow a good thing to become a God thing. When we allow a good thing, a good gift from God, to not be received with thankfulness from God, but instead to control our lives. So how do we deal with idols? Well, likely the Thessalonians is not enough just to turn away from idols. If they'd stopped worshipping idols and worshipped nothing, that would have done them no good. Now they've got to start serving and living for the, the one true God. We can try and kill idolatry as much as we like, but what we really need is to turn to God, to know that he is the source of everything we need, which possibly is why God allows us to go through suffering. To serve him, not out of fear that if we don't, bad things will happen, but know that he is our good father. And living for him is freedom. We are being who we were created to be. And to do this as we look forward to the return of Jesus, as we wait for Jesus. It's often hard to live for Jesus, isn't it? So we need this eternal perspective. Our certain hope is eternity with him. We need this eternal perspective because it can feel risky to live for Jesus. It it might feel risky. What if the old gods get angry? What if Jesus doesn't give me joy and security? What if I can't pay the bills? What if my kids get sick? Well, at the end of this chapter, we're told it's worth the bet. It's worth trusting in Jesus. It's not risky because it's a certain bet that wrath is coming. Guaranteed. Turning to God is worth it because wrath is coming, but even more because of the reward of eternity with Christ. So how can we know genuine Christianity? How do we tell the real thing from a scam? How do we see it in others? But maybe more importantly, how do we see it in ourselves? Well, we see it in thankfulness. Are you growing in being a thankful person? Think back over this week. Count your grumbles. Count your thankses. Are we growing to be a thankful person, not only for God's provision in this life, but even more, his eternal provision in Christ? When you hear of other people becoming Christians, whether it's in our church or another church, does that fill your heart with thankfulness? So one, thankfulness. Two, have you received the gospel? Has it come with power, the Holy Spirit and full conviction? In times of affliction, have you known the joy that comes from the Spirit? Three, have you turned from idols? Put them behind you to serve God and now to look forward to the return of our Saviour, Jesus. Look, if you fall from a scam, it might cost you a few dollars. Uh, you'll probably feel a little bit embarrassed, but honestly, it's not that much of a, it's not that big a deal, is it really? Might lose a bit of money, might feel a bit embarrassed. But if you fall for scam religion, for fake faith, the consequences are eternal. So do you have genuine faith, saving faith in Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, there is so much we should give thanks to you for but often we don't. We forget that every good and perfect gift comes from you, both the things of creation, but even more the things of salvation in Jesus. Please grow us in thankfulness. Help us turn away from grumbling, fill our hearts with thankfulness, especially as we see your Holy Spirit at work in others. Please grow our confidence and certainty in the truth of the gospel. Give us joy in the certainty of eternity, even in times of struggle and suffering. And please keep turning our hearts to yourself. Help us put sin to death, to kill idols in our hearts, and to instead love you with all our mind, heart, and strength. Please do this, that Jesus might be glorified in us, his church. Amen.